Hello and welcome. Here we are in lecture six. So continuing on learning more about Chisel and Scala, we're going to try to make better structured, better functioning generators. So at this point, you're going to some pretty cool stuff. You can um, not only build simple modules like you know in Verilog, you can have combination logic, sequential logic, etc. But we covered some amount of parameterization, right? We talked a little bit about having for loops and parameters that kind of be a little more sophisticated. And so they would take that one step further. Uh, we're going to, you know, kind of having more flexibility and more parameterization, more generation. We want to go ahead and um, actually organize that somehow. So thus, today's topic is about encapsulation. Uh, in particular, uh, we're talking about how to encapsulate in a few different ways. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about objects and classes in Scala. We kind of gave you a primer in that last week. We're going to go a little bit more now. We'll come back to that again in a few weeks talking about inheritance. We're kind of doing this, you know, a little bit of a time approach for some of these core concepts. Um, it's kind of about to kind of package things up together. And along the way, we'll talk about recursion, which is a nice way of, you know, constructing our uh, generators and kind of, you know, breaking a bigger problem, a smaller problem as an alternative using for loops. Okay, so uh, we'll go ahead and load up our notebook as always. Uh, cool. There we go. Okay, so in terms of declaring a function in Scala or a method, I should say, uh, you've already been kind of been doing it, uh, right? Uh, you know, even the modules we've been declaring are technically methods, right? And so, uh, you know, the kind of key details are you say def, you give it a name, you give it a body, oh, sorry, the arguments, and it's name, colon, type, and you can have colon and more of them. And you know you can have a one-line one where you just go equals and then the, the functionality. You can have multi-line ones, you know, with braces. Um, and then sometimes you have functions that uh, you know uh, don't return anything. You know, so let me go and run these first. I'll do don't return anything in a second. Um, right. So sure, you know we can define a function that's one. We define a function. We called it with five, and then you know prints out return six. This example is just showing uh, having a default argument, right? So we have another argument, we give a default value. If we give that value, we run the function, we get you know, the new value, otherwise we get the, the default, sure. Um, so by default, all these things are you know uh, immutable, right? No, they can't be changed. You can declare an argument as var, uh, but hopefully that's not necessary. Um, and the other thing I was mentioning is, so notice how there's no return statement, right? It's kind of very functional style of, hey, you just say, here's the body, and then it's the last line, so it's returned, right? So remember from like if and else, we kind of had the same thing where if and else statements actually return something, on, don't just execute, actually return something. And the last line of your if block or an else block, the thing is returned. Same thing is true with functions. So, you know, if I had a multi-line function, the last thing is returned, uh, and let's say, I want to make you know a printing function. So let's say we give it a string. So this is not going to return anything, right? Because I'm just printing, right? And you can say, hey, print line s, right? So this should be okay. Yeah, and then I can say, hey, you know, right? And so this one doesn't have an equals in a return value because it doesn't return anything. Um, some style guides are discouraging this. Uh, and they're encouraging you to have everything have a return type. And so in that case, you can say, you know, it's unit. Unit's kind of their, their equivalent of void. Uh, right, so it's the same. And same thing, if you have a function like this, you can mark this as, you know, returning, and then you can give the type, right? So you type inference, and a lot of time it's pretty clear. Like in this case, I have an int argument. It's a one-line function. I argue that putting an int in like this makes it more confusing. It makes it more cluttered, right? It's actually better not to have that inference. So verbose, but for recursive functions, for example, in see a few minutes, you're required to give the type. Cool. Any initial questions? Great. Okay. Let's go ahead and put these to work, right? So, oh, my few minutes a minute now for recursion. So, you know, you've probably seen recursion in other courses. You, you know, you write a function, you call your function again. Uh, when doing recursion, it's important to think of your your base case, right? You know why you know you're going to stop, um, and then uh, you also need to specify the return type, right? If you don't specify the return type, it's going to yell at you because it can't necessarily always infer that. Um, so yeah, here we have a simple one which you know recursively adds up 
uh, everything from the number n going down to zero, right? So n, n minus one, n minus two, et cetera. Um, here we wrote it with tail recursion, sure. Yeah, okay, so four plus three plus two plus one is 10. Okay, yeah, that works out. Um, we can define some more functions, right? Maybe a class that we may have seen in programming classes is Fibonacci for recursion, even though it's not the most efficient way to compute Fibonacci, right? And we can even um, print out, you know, the first uh, 10 Fibonacci numbers. So here we have, you know, our recursive Fibonacci function, and then we have uh, calling it in a for loop, right? But sure. Cool, so this is helpful, right? So recursion is a nice uh, thing to have handy for us. It's something that I think the Scala folks really encourage because it's a nice it's part of functional programming. You can use recursion instead of um, mutation a lot of times because by making a new function call, you kind of can reassign the variables with the arguments, right? It's kind of a way to basically mutate in a way, but you're not really mutating, you're just calling another function. So I will see an example of that in a second. Um, okay, so thinking more about why we're using these Scala functions, right? Like I said, at the end of the day, our chisel designs, they're legal Scala programs. All they do are instantiate and connect hardware, right? So we want to make a generator more flexible. We're just thinking about, okay, we're going to be more clever about what combination of things we instantiate and how we connect them, right? And so our goal is to hopefully do this in a way that, you know, not only is flexible for the use cases of the generator, but also as a code, you know, is easy for us to manage, easy for others to use. We want to kind of encapsulate and hide complexity, right? And so, you know, you can imagine ideal generator is something, you know, someone wrote once and we can reuse it widely and use it many places, right? But more generally, we want something to kind of just as easy to work with, right? And so um, today we're seeing some examples using recursion to perform iteration, right? So we saw it on Monday using, on oh, Monday, last Friday, sorry, using for loops with var to do iteration, or even the for loops without var and being very clever and kind of dancing around the issue. We can use that recursion today. And we're going to do a few other things. In addition to recursion, we're also going to use functions to declare chisel components without them being modules, right? So this is one of these things where um, this kind of the two go hand in hand, right? With, with recursion and other things, we're going to have functions that are returning and we're operating on chisel things but aren't necessarily a fully fledged module by themselves. Remember that eventually everything needs to turn into a module, but in the initial building construction declaration process, it can be outside of a module and then kind of included inside one. Um, cool. Okay, so let's go forward, not backward. Okay, so this is what we had from last uh, lecture, right? You know, we had this shift register, we called it delay n to take this n parameter, and we delay the input by n cycles, right? So we saw it a few different ways. This is the way with the mutation in the for loop, right? So we have a var, and you know, okay, we connect it. And so, yeah, we know if we want to do two cycles of delay. You know, this works just fine. It's parameterized, so we can do three. Uh, we can do three. And actually, uh, this one does support zero, right? Unlike the one we had before. Uh, it connects it straight through. Cool, so that's, that's pretty neat. Um, let's see what we might do with recursion. Okay, so if recursion it looks pretty similar, what are we doing? So instead of this four plus var combo, we're doing uh, this helper function being used recursively. And so this is kind of a very common pattern where we have this, you know, linear sequence rather than a loop. We just recall linearly, you know, tail recursion. Uh, and so this ends kind of tracking how far we are in this, you know, call. So that makes you sure terminate. And then between all these calls, we want to kind of pass along this last connection, which is the thing that we are using as a var over here. So kind of as I said a few minutes ago, right, that we can use recursion in a way to kind of give us the feeling of mutation, right? Where here we were using the for loop to iterate uh, i and then mutating lathcon. Here we're using the recursion to, you know, iterate through i, right? Or in this case, n or n minus one, et cetera, respectively i. And then we're mutating lathcon as it's the argument to the function. So you know, it seems like a little bit of kind of like a sleight of hand, not really a true fundamental change. The point is that um, in some ways, it's much easier to reason about this from a functional programming point of view, right? Where you can imagine you know, if I can convince myself that both these cases are correct and, you know, that it terminates at the right time, that you can make much stronger reasoning about this. And from the point of view of this function invocation, these things are, you know, immutable. There's still some nice properties about this. Um, in terms of what it produces, it's the same thing, right? It's going to be different naming because of the way chisel was called that by the time the you know, internal chisel graph is developed, 
you know, it maybe has different um, structure, or not different structure, but different names associated with it. But topologically, it's the same, right? It's just have the different variable names. And yeah, this one also supports zero, no problem. So I'm going to go straight to that base case. Uh, so this works, right? Um, this is kind of a contrived example. We'll see some other ones where uh, using recursion is seemingly not just comparable to iteration, but even like more natural. Uh, but cool. Uh, questions? OK. Um, let's keep going. So uh, you're going to hear me not just so far, but going forward, use the word class and object kind of interchangeably. Uh, I try to remember to be careful with Scala, and I, it's just too ingrained. So um, Scala has both of these keywords, and they mean different things. So uh, a class is what we're used to in most object-oriented languages, right? You can go ahead and define a class. You can instantiate a class instance. That's what we're used to. Object is interesting. So object is their way of dignifi signifying something as a singleton, meaning there is only one instance. Can't be more than one instance. And what's also interesting is it exists for all time, right? Usually for objects, it's like, oh, if I constructed, they're not constructed. It. A singleton just exists, right? Your program launches, the singletons all exist. Your program dies, they all die at that point, right? So they just, so singleton exists for the entire duration of the program. And so this is a concept that's perhaps more familiar to PL people who are used to object oriented programming. A lot of us in courses, we learn, you know, Java or stuff plus. And when we were taught about classes, uh, we may have heard about singletons, you know, we've heard about static or something like that, but maybe we didn't quite embrace it as heavily as you'll see here. So one of the things people use this for is something called the factory uh, pattern. So this is actually a programming pattern called the factory method pattern, meaning that actually you have not just a declarable class as well as a singleton object, they actually work together, right? So it's actually referred to as a companion object in that case. You can have an object by itself, you can have a class by itself, or you can have them be working together as companions. So have them work together as companions, and you have the same name, and they have some kind of special abilities, right? And so um, we're going to see some of the special abilities in the next few slides. But the reason why we have this is sometimes singleton is helpful for a number of reasons. Right? Number one, uh, there may be times where you just want to declare a function, and you don't necessarily want to associate a function with a class. You just want to have a function. In normal Scala, not the Scala in the notebooks, but like Scala you write like in the file that runs in the compiler, you can't just write a function. It has to be inside of an object, right? Even like main is actually a function inside of an object, right? And so um, it has to be somewhere. So number one, you might have to declare an object just to have a place to have some place for your functions, even if you don't want them to such an instance. But then um, that's a stateless function, right? That's one of them. But there's other reasons, right? Another reason maybe you want to have shared state, right? So in this contrived example, let's say you have a class called my pair, which takes in two numbers, and you sure can add them up. So uh, if we go ahead and run this code, yeah, OK, we define the class. We have an instance called my pair. Uh, great. That's, you know, my pair is MPC. On uh, in this instance, we can call the method, right? We can call sum. Uh, notice how we can call sum without the parentheses. This is a, a Scala thing. So the function doesn't take any arguments. You can omit the parentheses. And it's actually encouraged from a style point of view. If your function doesn't change anything internally, like an immutable function, just reading or accessing something, or even just calculating something, but after function call, nothing has changed about the internal state anywhere. You're actually encouraged to drop the parentheses, right? And the reason why is that from the point of view as a user of this code calling this, you know, you can't tell if sum is a field or a function, right? And you shouldn't necessarily need to know, right? If it's a function that returns, that doesn't change anything, why should you care about the difference, right? You shouldn't is the answer. And so it was kind of the mentality. So for language, yeah, for argumentless functions that don't change anything, you can drop the parentheses. If you forget this or don't like this, you can still put them on. If it's an argument list function that does change something, you are heavily encouraged for parentheses on to get clear that this is actually a function, not just a accessing a field. Um, so the language is kind of fun. It's a little bit of different style. Some places you kind of pay attention to that. Um, but yeah, so sure, we declared a class that can do certain things. We won't make new when we got to say new my pair. Now, here we've made a companion object. So what does this one do? This one does a few things. Number one, it counts how many pairs have been declared ever, right? Okay. And it also has a constructor. So you may remember that uh, when we talked about classes last week, we mentioned that you know in the class body, you know, it's kind of these arguments given at the top, and that's kind of like you know the arguments you have, right? And there may be cases where you know we're used to many languages where you want to have 
overload the constructor. You want to have different constructors for different cases for a given object, right? And so you can get some of that behavior by perhaps you know, having default arguments in here. That's doable. But to get the full generality you might want of overloaded constructors, this is where the companion object can be really helpful. So in this case, apply is actually a keyword in Scala. And so what you're saying is uh, when someone does my pair and then parens immediately, that's going to call an apply method. What's inside those parentheses is going to try and match the type signatures, right? So you can see, for example, here I have my pair 2, comma 3. And so that's going to match this type signature, which is two integers. And what's it going to do? It's going to declare a my pair. And it's also going to count the repairs we've made, right? So for example, if we maybe I'll go ahead and remove this one. And yeah, okay, now we have a new my pair instance. I can go ahead and you know call ask it to do some like we did before. We can also query how many pairs we've declared, and it says two. Um, how do we get two? Oh, you're right. I didn't save it in a variable. Thank you. Yeah, so the question, the great answer from the student who puts the recording was I constructed one and then I constructed another one. I didn't actually save this in the val, right? So yeah, so if I said val m and then I said this, that should be one. Whew, okay, cool. Programming still works. Um, yes, great, great observation. Um, yes, go ahead. Correct. Yeah. So some, you know, method is declared up here, which just takes two arguments and adds them together, right? So this is just we declared one that was two comma three again. This is the second declaration. So declaration one, declaration two. This one is two comma three. Um, but yeah, like I said, if we, let's say we want to overload this. We want to have the ability to declare uh, a pair with only one argument, right? Uh, so in this case, we do that and. When you have other constructors, when possible, it's a great good practice to uh, reuse them internally. So that way you kind of have a common code base, right? So in this case, we actually just call the other one with zero as a second argument. Um, and so also notice how we're declaring objects here by just calling, this technically we're calling the apply method on the companion object rather than saying new. Some people really like the syntax of we're having to say new. And so, um, this is nice, but there's other times where it's just more convenient to kind of have these companion objects construct things where they can call new for you, they can have any shared state. Other times you may have multiple forms of the constructor, so you can have overlay constructors inside a companion object, and they can kind of do the right thing for you. So the arguments here are kind of like the exhaustive always arguments, but maybe you don't want users calling these, instead you want users calling things you define over here, and you kind of hide the actual class from them, you only give them the companion object. Um, yeah, it's, a, it's at first you're kind of like, oh my gosh, what is this? And what's funny you talk to PL folks is that, uh, you know, it's like, oh yeah, companion object, factory method, sure. And then like, I've, I've been programming a long time before I learned Scala and I never heard those terms before, right? So uh, if you're, if those are new to you too, welcome to the club. We are all in the same boat. Um, but so we can kind of use them as we need to. We don't always need to do it all the time. Uh, it becomes more clear as time goes on about what to go into an object versus a class. Like for example, Maybe there's, you know, things like an enum, right? You know, things we talked about earlier. Okay, I want to have an enum, which is, you know, uh, like the standard states for a thing. Maybe those should go inside the object. That way I can kind of hang on to those. Or maybe I have constants or whatever. It doesn't go in the object. Um, cool. Yeah, so we can run the rest of this code out. Sure, we can sum up the one here, which is three, zero. And then, you know, one, two, three calls to my pair is what's the three we're seeing down there. Yes. Okay, so the question was, if I put val a here, what happens? Uh, so the only thing is actually no change inside the class in internally. The change is external. So internal, without this val, this a is still immutable. It's still effectively like a val, like used to val being constant. If we want to make it changeable, we'll have to declare it as var. Now, the difference with the val here is I can access it, right? So if I don't do that, and then... Uh, 
for now, I'm going to comment this out so it's easy to kind of see the output. So just go ahead and declare one of these and actually, sorry, we want this one, but not these. Okay, so if I do this, it's going to yell at me. Because these are by default uh, private to the scope of the class. By calling this val, it makes it public. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, correct. Yeah, so I, mean, I, mean, I think they're kind of expand on your, your point. Yes, so another way to think of it is these uh, parameters are persistent fields in the class, right? They aren't just only for instructor call. They're, they're there for the, for the lifetime of the class. So you're right. For a lot of classes, you might have most of the fields actually all here, which is why perhaps maybe you want them to be constructed by a constructor from the companion object and kind of deliberately massaged accordingly. Yeah, great question. So for object-oriented programming, would I have getters or setters or something? Yes, yes, you would have getters or setters, right? Of course, having a setter uh, is, uh, you know, like making immutable, so maybe you're not going to do that. In terms of the getter, well, you get it for free if you do that. Interestingly, if you have a val inside the body, it's actually also public by default, right? So if I say val c you know, equals a minus b. Oops. Oh, well, that's going to yell at me for that, but it's not going to be not going to have a problem with that. So actually, everything inside the body is actually publicly visible as the scope, but these are actually the only things private by default. You actually can mark things as private, but by default, these are the only ones that are private, and then you can make them public. And so, yeah, if I want to have that be accessible, then sure, I can have a like that, and then I don't need to write a getter. It's kind of there. I forget what lecture it is, but in a few lectures, I'm going to cover something called a case class, which is a super helpful thing in Scala, which is kind of like a special kind of class. I kind of deliberately spread out all of the object-oriented stuff in this course so we we're not going to be overwhelmed all at once. So we did our first class, you know, last week. This week we're doing Scala and class, or object in class. In the future, we'll do case classes and inheritance, right? And so case classes are kind of a special kind of class. It's kind of pretty cool where a lot of things you would like are kind of enabled by default. And the reason why it's not for all classes, there's some things they can't do. So I will come to that when we get there. But like, this is a very rich language. There's a zillion features. And uh, you're hearing my opinionated take on the subset that makes for, I would argue, flexible hardware generation without being overly complicated. Um, yeah, question, yes. Uh, actually, they're just different instances, right? So the question was on lines 20 and 21, uh, what's going on? These are two different instances, right? So this is going to return a new my pair, And because I didn't put this into a val or anything, the, the reference is just lost, right? That code is run, but then nobody's hanging on to reference. So it's going to be you know, removed by the garbage collector, right? It's not going to be saved. This one also returns a reference. We call sum on it, but then we do nothing with that. And it's also going to be discarded. So normally you would, you know, say, hey, I should have say val, you know, uh, you know, mp equals. But if I don't do that, yeah, it gets discarded by the garbage collector. It's not nothing. Nothing's hanging on to that. Oops. Uh, cool. Great. These are wonderful questions. More questions. Yes. Yeah. That's a great question. The question is, you know, if you have multiple objects or singletons, they live for all time, but they have to be constructed at some point. If there's multiple objects, of so what order are they can internally evaluate that as part of that initial bootstrapping process? Um, I don't know is the answer. Uh, I feel like this might be related to like the importing problem, right? Where you, you can't have circular dependencies, right? And so, however, I suspect it might be similar to how that dependence problem is resolved. So, for example, uh, if one object is going to use the internals of another object, in order for it to be possible, it has to have imported the other object. So the other object 
presumably that code's already been evaluated? Question mark. <laughs> uh, we can we can try that right now. Uh, so let's say if I declare object uh, fun test, um, and we say val uh, np equals my pair dot uh, num pairs. We don't even need to save it. We need to say print line. This might work. We'll find out. Let's comment some stuff out so we can see the result. Uh, oh, well, this ran, but no one's going to execute that, right? There's no method to like. So, yeah, I mean, it, it ran this print line. Maybe, maybe it didn't. I'm not sure. Okay, I should look this up and get back to you. I have not done this scenario. I usually don't have a lot of code like to run inside the object that's like, Outside of, usually the objects are like methods, and then um, there might be a field or two in here, but I usually don't have non-trivial code in here. So why is this not printing? I don't know. Maybe it's suppressed during this time period. Good question. I'll find this out and put it on Slack. Cool. Other questions? Great. Okay. So uh, now that we're all pro with factory, uh, factory methods and you know, our companion objects, let's make a counter companion object. So we had this counter from last time, right? So this is the code that uses the when, it's kind of the most human readable. And so um, for now, it's not too crazy, right? We could take the original code, call new counter, and then boom, we get the counter. Then we wrote a companion object, which doesn't do anything fancy. It just literally calls new for us. And that's gonna return the same code. Um, now, in this case, like I said, we didn't do anything special here, right? It's just literally an example of showing us in chisel. But you can imagine the reason why you'd be tempted to do this is maybe either have shared state inside object or you have multiple constructors. You kind of want some non-trivial different, you know, overloading of the constructor. Uh, for example, you know, chisel internally has a counter and standard library and there is uses a companion object that we have multiple things to choose from. Cool, so I think that might be the next slide. Uh, not quite. Okay, so here's an example of, this is a Scala method. Notice it does not extend module. Um, so you can do chisely things kind of in a vacuum here. And the reason why this is not yelling at me is because in the end, it's actually finds its way inside of a module, right? So as long as your chisel stuff finds its way inside of a module, that's okay. So the way we got here was, you know, this calls the companion object factory method. Okay, my counter apply, which makes a new one of these, which does all this, then puts it in over here. Now, one thing that's worth noting is uh, this is returning a field from this class instance. So count is a, in this case, a chisel register, right? So that way, um, when someone actually calls our factory method, in this case, they aren't actually getting the full class. What they're getting is they're getting a reference to a register which holds the count. Because of the work done by this method body, that register happens to already be connected to a few things, including you know uh, these muxes that control itself, right? And so it's kind of this interesting thing where like. Uh, because you know we kind of built this design graph, sure we're only pointing to the count at this point, but that count itself is connected to the various things. Those other things are kind of coming along for the ride, and because that code's running inside this module code here, it still has a what they call a builder context you know, in Chisel in order to have something to actually make this run. So I would love to just write you know UN stuff directly uh, for these Jupyter notebooks, but known for Chisel we need to have this builder context to kind of have this stuff make Chisel work. But it is possible to have, you know, not just classes, or not just functions, entire uh, classes that construct and manipulate chisel objects without um, being inside a module. And if you're surprised by this, realize we did this 10 minutes ago, right? With our example over here, right? This function is operating on chisel objects and it's definitely not a module, right? It's just a scholar recursive function, right? So you can definitely have functions and classes operate directly on chisel things. 
at some point, they need to be inside of a module to have a builder context, but uh, we can kind of put them together as we want. And so, yeah, today we kind of have these, you know, uh, contrived examples. We know things like counters exist in the Chisel standard library, but we're kind of trying to show you some of these features and things that are familiar, and then we'll start using them in more sophisticated ways. Whew, okay. I guess I can go ahead and run this so we can see this run. Um, but I'll take questions too, please. Yeah. So yeah, so the, the, for a lot of generators, you're probably gonna wanna have a nicer API or a nicer interface by using a companion object to have multiple constructors and that kind of stuff. But it's an example of really kind of show that, yeah, you can definitely um, get a lot of mileage by doing direct chisel components, right? And so things like the counter from standard chisel library, I believe uh, aren't even inside a module, which is this one, here we go. So for example, if you try to just declare a chisel counter by itself, it's correct chisel. It's actually not a module. Um, so we have to build a module around it to so actually can run it in the tester or get very log for it. Uh, yeah, so chisel counter is actually pretty cool. You just, you know, give it an IO enable and the maximum value and it does the rest. Um, and then uh, the chisel counter actually returns two things. If you forgot which was which, we can go ahead and read the API docs and I don't have internet. So we can imagine the API docs there. I'll give it one minute chance to work. Heaven knows, oh, oh, maybe, maybe. Yes, okay, great. So here we are in the API docs, right? So you can see that um, there are multiple uh, things here. Now, this is a good thing to look at carefully the API docs. You're like, oh yeah, counter, that's what I want. Pay attention up here. There's a C for class. There's also an O for object. So if you forget and look over here, you also can see that there's both. So for example, you were looking at that signature, right? We were looking at a second ago and saying, oh wait, yeah, I called counter with a, you know, chisel bool and a number. And I look at this thing and I see just a number. So wait, how did that work? Uh, how that worked is we were calling the companion object, right? Remember how over here, we didn't say new counter, we just said counter. So we're calling the companion object, right? And so the companion object has a few different choices, right? You can call it with, the condition like we just did and the integer number, that's the one we're calling. You can call it like this without enable and just always have the hardwired enabled. Or you could call it in the more sophisticated way of a range, right? You actually want to be not just a simple linear range. Um, and so the few things kind of here, the documentation kind of telling you what's going on. Also notice how this thing doesn't return a module, right? It returns a tuple, you know, two different chisel things, a uint and a bool. And in this case, if you forgot what they were, right? It tells you a tuple returns the counter. That's the first one. And then this one, some people want this wrap functionality. So a lot of times you use a counter, you care about when the counter expires and wraps around. It's an important thing for you to act on. So that's why the second one is the wrap. Um, so in other words, you know, if I'm counting from zero to four, so zero, one, two, three, four, and then I want to be notified I'm at the maximum value, I'm gonna wrap around to zero so that way whoever was waiting on four cycles now knows that four cycles have passed. And so when you actually go ahead and use counters in your designs, you often find that wrap scenario is pretty important. It depends on your design, exactly how you want that wrap to be used. So sometimes it's worth paying attention to that. But something wrap or wrap like is definitely something that's very helpful. Um, the other thing I said I want to point out is that yeah, here we have, you know, object versus class, right? So class is what you think you need, but usually you're actually intended to, uh, it even tells you, right, typically instantiated by the, the object. Uh, and also it tells you this does not create a module. Now, the natural question might be, why are we so obsessed with not creating modules, right? What's wrong with modules? Nothing's wrong with modules, right? Uh, why do we want this? Well, number one, for something like we did earlier in today's lecture, we're using it recursively. Uh, I would rather get one module than like, you know, N minus one modules here. <laughs> Right, so like from a readability point of view, passing the tools point of view, like with recursion, it would be excessive, right, to have module. And if you're not doing recursion, sometimes you don't want a module boundary because of the way it looks in the very longer the way it gets past the tools later on, where even though modern CAD tools are quite good at optimizing across module boundaries, a lot of times people in big designs flatten the design first as you know, they move to hierarchy. 
And there are times you want a hierarchy. You want to be aware of certain things. You want to be aware that these modules are inside other modules. You want to be aware these modules are the exact same modules we instantiate someplace else. In so much case, you do want to be a little more deliberate about your modules and which is a module, which is not a module. And so there's times where what you want is a little bit of code flexibility, a little bit of code parameterization. But you don't necessarily want to pay a module for that, right? And so here's some examples we've seen for that, right? So counter is a good example where you want your bigger module to have a counter internally to do whatever it needs to do, but you don't necessarily want a counter to be a separate thing in the waveform and everything else. And so, you know, here we're just kind of making just enough chisel to be a counter, which really just is, you know, a register plus an adder, right? To be like a, an accumulator. And then here we have to include a set of modules in order to make the thing print out. But I mean, that's kind of the point. Um, so we can see the wrap. Okay, and if we go ahead and, yeah, I can, you know, change the value, no problem. Uh, cool. So uh, other than us doing demos in class about counters, you should um, uh, use the built-in one rather than writing your own. Now here we use that one API we just showed, which was this one, right? You can also take in a range. And then if you take in this version, you can see structure is actually pretty smart. It has um, uh, default arguments, right? These are ones where you can give it or not give it, right? So I can give it a bool if I want to have it enable or, or even a reset, or I can even not include these and they're both true and false, right? And so we could even have a counter, for example, that counts by two. That's not visible, but yes, that's by two. Um, and so, yeah, this one's gonna, you know, should be, oops, I gotta run this first, then this one, and there is plus two. What do you look? Yeah, yeah, you use a counter for a lot of things. Yeah, they're, they're extremely helpful, right? So uh, why would I use a counter for the recording? Um, yeah, so the most common scenario is you want to wait a certain number of cycles. Your protocol requires you to you know, do a transaction and wait 20 cycles. A counter is a great way to kind of have everything in the state machine kind of go idle until that counter goes off and you know it's time to move to the next thing. Um, in a processor, yeah, you could probably use a counter. I think you might manually write the PC uh, for processor because maybe there's scenarios like for branches where it's not always plus four. You kind of want to handle those cases especially. But yeah, counters are really helpful. This is why it's an understandable library and kind of like a default like thing to kind of use. A good question. Cool. Okay. Um, then when it comes to, we have a pause for any more because yeah, we kind of covered a lot before we go on. We're gonna change gears a little bit. So bundle. So one of the things you kind of see from this course, a lot of things we've had in our earlier chisel examples, we oh yeah, just write chisel this way. And there's some kind of keywords or some things in there that's kind of just treating like boilerplate. As this course goes on, there'll be less boilerplate and more understanding why it's doing certain things. Um, so no, so far we've been telling you, oh yeah, I get to write, you know, uh, an IO. Oh yeah, our modules, you need to have an IO bundle. We really talk about this, right? So what is a bundle? Uh, a bundle is something in chisel that's an aggregate type, right? So in other words, you can have multiple things inside the same type. In particular, it's what they call a named Type, that type of name fields, right? So you can say I have, you know, different fields and give them names. So coming from C, this is like a struct, right? I can have, you know, a struct and then that fields inside of a struct. Um, so by default, we've been using them for IO because you know your IO is required to be one thing and we usually have multiple ports, right? So by declaring a bundle and calling it IO, we now can get multiple ports. Technically, for future reference, there's something called a multi-IO module. You can extend a different thing and you can get multiple IOs, but not needed for this course. But normally you only have one IO to use a bundle, but it's much more than just IO, right? You can declare a collection of signals and then you can do stuff with it, right? You can put bundles inside bundles. You can use object-oriented inheritance to extend bundles. Um, you can even put code inside of bundles to do more stuff for you. So uh, there's a lot of other things you can do with it. So in this case, for example, we're declaring a bundle called mag, or maybe short for magnitude. And then, yeah, sure, it can have a field. And we can, you know, use this directly in terms of how we're declaring the I.O. And yeah, we can go ahead and, you know, that's something just missed a constant in this case. But the kind of key thing is, yeah, it's seeing, we can just declare these bundles elsewhere. So one thing that's really helpful is, for example, if you have I.O. And there's a certain uh, protocol you're building, you know, maybe it's like Axie, this, you know, ARM-based protocol for communicating. And you have, you know, 
I need to have a wire, a bus is this many bits, a wire is this many bits, a wire is this many bits. You have all these different fields to put together. You can declare a bundle once and then elsewhere in your code, you can just use that bundle. So rather than kind of keep copying and pasting very long, if I go back a slide, you know, imagine this is a non-trivial module and you have, you know, 30 or 40 wires here. And you write 30 or 40 lines of ports on one module and you write another module that talks to it. And I want to also write 30 or 40 lines. And you're going to keep those two sets of ports consistent, the sizes and the names. That seems like a pain in the butt, right? And so, no, don't do that, right? Declare a bundle. Don't repeat yourself. And then you can kind of instantiate elsewhere. And so, because you can nest bundles, you can have a bundle. Okay, this protocol is one bundle. And the I over this entire module might have, you know, a protocol on one bundle here. I have like a USB 5 versus like, you know, a HDMI bundle versus whatever. You can have multiple bundles inside of your I.O., for example. And so, how does it really kind of declare things and then compose them would be really, really helpful. Um, and so, yeah, so going from here, what can we do? Well, like I said, we can kind of extend them, nest them, et cetera. And so here's what we just saw. Uh, and so, yeah, why don't we extend this bundle to not just be a magnitude, but to be sign and magnitude, right? You know, it's that other way of doing sign numbers. And so because we're extending in the object-oriented sense, we get all of the fields from here, right? So this new sign mag type, has not only this sign here, which is a bool, but also has the m, which is the, you know, the magnitude, right? And so, okay, cool. Now we have a sign and magnitude type. If we're gonna keep composing things. Why not put a vec inside there? We saw vex with iOS last time. You can put vex inside bundles, no problem. So we can say, hey, we can have this bundle type, which is a vec of two of these sign and magnitude things, which actually internally both have a magnitude and a sign. So sure, here's some you know trivial module which what does it do? Well it uh takes the uh you know it produces these as output and here we are hard coding the outputs to these things. Um so sure we output you know zero and three and four, et cetera. But the key thing is the scene you kind of can compose things together. One thing I'll point out when it comes to IOs in particular, but bundles can be used for things other than IOs too. Uh, ports and IOs need to have directions, right? You need to be input or output, right? Um, and so where does that come from? Here, inside the bundle, we've declared the port directions. Uh, you also can declare things um, without the directions. And it's going to yell at me. Uh, but that's fine temporarily. Oh, it defaulted the output. But normally, you'd be required to you know, uh, do this. So at some point it needs to be given a direction. This might be more clear in the next slide. Uh, oh, brief moment. I intentionally don't delete this slide because I want you to be aware the language is constantly changing and improving. So prior to a year ago, whenever you declared your own bundle, you had to write this stupid boilerplate code down here. It was really annoying. Uh, and the Chisel developers got really, really clever and figured out a way to avoid the need for this. And so I, I keep the slide to remember that yes, they're still doing good work, they're still improving things. As of Chisel 3.5, this clone type method, you don't even know it exists. But so I include this because I want folks to be aware that um, language is improving. Uh, cool. Um, all right, so let's go back to what we just showed a second ago. So remember, I said you can declare things with bundles that have no directions. We did that here. And now we're imposing the directions and we actually put them inside an IO. So here we defined sign and mag as a bundle here, and then we can sign shape one for each port, right? So we can have, and if you kind of have this nested bundles where you have, you know, an IO, an in, then here you just use um, multiple fields to reach it. So maybe we'll do this first one uh, right now. Uh, okay. Uh, and just run this. Okay, sure, great. Here in this case, we're just passing through this, these bundles, whatever. One that seems about bundles is something called a bulk connect operator. That's this thing. And so it's going to automatically look at the fields and try to match them up. Um, and it's one of these things where it usually does the right thing. But as a designer, you should be a little leery. If you've written system Verilog, you maybe have experienced using the star operator connect IOs where you can, you know, have two, a module and they have a port name and you can just use star and it connects the things that match that name and that scope. And hopefully, you know, I say, you know, clock, I get the right clock. Um, 
it's kind of like that, where it's like, if you do this in exactly the right cases, it's very short, very nice code. Uh, when it comes to bulk index, I would say it's a lot safer than the Verilog stopper operator, but not perfect, right? So, for example, if you bulk connect and uh, because of some parameterization, the IOs aren't exactly the same, it'll still connect them. And it will, you know, appropriately prune or truncate as needed, right? And so that many times is the behavior you want, which is why it's the default behavior, but maybe that's not what you want, right? So um, it's worth being aware of that. Yes, questions? Oh, yeah, the question is, does left and right matter for a bulk connect? Um, I don't believe so. And the reason why, so bulk connect is actually pretty smart. So, you know, you can imagine IOs when you have a lot of fields and bundles, a given bundle will have ports in both directions, right? Inputs and outputs. And so this will go in and connect, you know, the inputs on one side to the outputs on the other side and vice versa. So I don't know if there's a huge asymmetry left or right. I believe there might be a difference in terms of scenarios grabbing a second to go or if they don't match how it handles that. But um, I'm not familiar with being a huge left to right difference or full connects. Good question. Yeah, I said that you've, you folks are quickly getting to things I don't know. You're doing a great job. Um, yeah. In, in the bundle or over here. Yes. So the bulk connector is going to try and connect inputs to outputs. That's definitely what's going to happen. There's a whole theory which you can read about in the Fertile specifications, Fertile's the IR underlying chisel, where they have a notion of input and output. And they also have a notion of port type, which isn't necessarily input or output. It's like, I'm going to get the name wrong. They, they used to be gendered, and they've now used non-gendered terms. But uh, you can have, they aren't always one-to-one -one in terms of what's producing, what's consuming. Like input and output assumes a certain thing, but when it comes to stuff like connect operations uh, and whether something's a driver or a, you know, a sink, um, that can change. And so I've, forgive me for getting the fertile names for those terms. Like I said, it used to be called gender and they changed it like four years ago. I forgot what it's called now. Um, oh, and here we have more examples of directionality. Great. So uh, here we have you know, a bundle of you know, the directions specified. Hey, if I want to use this on both sides, I need to eventually at some point flip the polarity, right? And so there's the flipped operator, which lets me do that, right? So I can have this be the in, that be the out, and then here I'm using the bulk, right? So, you know, not a lot of chisel, and all of a sudden I have kind of this big thing being generated, right? Where I have the input in and ready. And notice how even though it's an in, it's actually an output, right? Because you're telling the person on the input port, this input port is ready to receive, right? And so this kind of happens when you have real world IOs. You have kind of both directions. This comes up. Um, but kind of the key thing to take away from this is it's pretty fun. You can make bundles. You can, um, uh, you know, change them around, uh, et cetera. Uh, cool. Yes, question. Yeah, so in response to the question, uh, if your IO contains a vector, will bull connect connect the vector? I believe yes. Usually when you have a vec, the situation is you want, um, you know, like one element to go to, to a different person. You know, so like I have like, if I use a vec and I have like four things in my vec, I want like this to go here, this to go here, this to go here, this to go here. So they're all going to different places. In that case, you, you wouldn't necessarily want to bull connect them. Now, doesn't mean you can't use the operator at all, right? The operator can be applied to different scopes. So maybe I could say, you know, you can imagine a scenario where I have a big IO. So I have, you know, so I have this VEC, whatever it is, right? And I can say, okay, I want to send I, you know, because maybe I'm using a for loop dot, you know, uh, that contents I want to send to somebody. So I'm not saying the entire vector, I'm saying somebody that like one instance. You can definitely do both connections on portions, right? You know, so IO dot, you know, bund A dot, you know, bund B, and then bulk connect, right? So you imagine when you have start having real hardware, um, 
you got a lot of bundles and IOs. Uh, one of the things I've always been curious about, and I've never actually had a chance to research, or maybe someone will be inspired and want to do this project, I'll happily share it online. Uh, it is my anecdotal observation that if you look at the topology of a software program and a hardware design, they're similar but different. So you look at when people write like well-written code in a language like Python, Java, Scala, whatever, humans are encouraged to limit number of lines per function, right? Usually you want to have, you know, 20, 50 lines. You have a hundred line function, someone's raising eyebrows at you. You can do it, but you're, you know, you're kind of discouraged. And, you know, likewise, the number of parameters to your function is, you know, usually not too many, like, you know, five plus, right? Five or less, right? And if you have, if you need a lot of parameters, you usually put that inside like an object or something, right? Usually you have like an object that has all your parameters. When you look at industrial scale hardware, uh, some modules are easily hundreds of thousands of lines and they don't know how to make it smaller. They don't want to make it smaller. They can't make it smaller. And this is kind of this weird service area to volume trade-off where it's like, you'd be like, oh, that module's too big, make it smaller. And like, you try to make it smaller and you have just even more IOs, right? Or like, they're like, this is why as a person who does research also in graph processing, it's kind of like, you see like topologically is kind of a more dispersed, less clustered kind of topology. And thus, when you try and start drawing boundaries around things, um, I feel like in hardware design, we end up with a lot more IOs than software programs have arguments. And so having the ability to do bundles, to do hierarchy and kind of reuse things makes your lives a lot easier. In big designs, you're going to spend so much time on IOs. Uh, and so having bundles makes that a much more tractable process. And if you don't believe me, uh, ask folks what's the best benefit of something like you know, Verilog mode and Emacs. And people will tell you, oh, yeah, I'm an all, core, you know, all pro guy using Verilog, and they love their Verilog mode and Emacs. Auto completion of IO is one of the things they most love. So even though we told you the star operator Verilog is dangerous, the Verilog mode in Emacs reads the Verilog file and will like fill in that thing for you because people don't like filling in the IOs as a pain in the butt. Question, yes. Uh, you would declare the original bundle to have maybe two sub bundles and you could you know call flipped on that sub bundle yeah there's for the question was what happens if you want to reverse only some but not all uh yeah you you'd want to have it kind of clustered up so this is one of the reasons why at first it seems a little bit counterintuitive to want to have like some different bundles and composing bundles but uh you you, you kind of try and adjust those boundaries to get the most reuse so maybe your first version is flat you just have the io bundle and then you realize oh wait this module talks to this other module okay so now i can pull out these common fields into a bundle and use them here. And then, okay, later on, you just keep writing more code in your project. You're like, oh, wait, uh, maybe I should make this a bundle because it makes it easy to kind of use it here. So it's, it's kind of constantly moving, constantly improving, kind of revising. And so my personal thing I recommend is write a single instance first, get that working, and then figure out how to generalize it. And so when it comes to bundles, maybe I said the first time you write the bundle directly inside the IO, later on, you start figuring out how to kind of refactor it and clean it up and share it. Good questions. Okay. Um, oh, so then uh, kind of the, the final thing we do today is talking about options or optional types. So I maybe skip right to the motivation. Why are we talking about optional types? Uh, let's just have optional fields in a bundle. That's kind of the key thing. So a lot of languages have this. Um, it's in you know Scala. Uh, I think Swift Plus added this in what, Swift Plus 17 or Swift Plus 14 added optional types. Um, so the idea of an optional type is you want to clearly convey that something is empty, right? So normally if you're writing like old school C code, you pick some sentinel value, like, okay, you know, this thing should never be null or should never be zero or it should never be negative one. And you as a programmer and you're working with that field, if you see a zero, a negative one or a null, you know that that's not holding valid data, you know it's empty, in quotes. And the point of an option type in language like Scala or other things in like modern Swiss Plus is to make this extremely clear and you know explicit. So that way you have the option as well as the saying it being empty or it's populated, right? And so in Scala, uh, with an option type, the type is an option. It technically is a generic, so you know it has an internal type what you're actually trying to hold. And it's either none, meaning it's nothing there. Or there's something there, meaning there's a value, right? And so, uh, you know, let's say in this case, I declare an option of type int, and I say, yes, as a value sum. What can I do with that? I have an option O. Well, I can see, is it defined? If it's defined, I can grab the value. Otherwise, I can say empty, right? So I'm going to run this code. 
hey, there was, there was some value four, so it printed out four. If I declared this to be a none and it was empty, then the code is going to say it's empty. Now, if I want to be kind of a little bit living dangerously and get it without checking, oops, I should, sorry, I should leave this as none. Well, I can do it this way first, right? That's fine. It's going to work, right? But now if I do this, uh oh, right? This is the cleaner version of a null pointer exception, right? That's basically what it is, right? This is basically saying, I tried to do work on something that was empty. The advantage is now this none type, I can make this more clear. So this is kind of like a null pointer exception, but uh, there. Normally you shouldn't get this, right? Normally you should be doing stuff like this and then you should recognize, oh wait, it's not there. So for today, we're doing option in this very verbose style. We're using this is defined method and the dot get method. Um, there are more graceful ways to use it. There's a get or else method. So if you want to you know, get it or get a default value, it makes sense. And then we'll see later on the course, we're starting functional programming. Uh, some functional programming methods uh, do some very, uh, I would say, graceful default behaviors on none that makes sense. And so in which case, the things that are options kind of magically disappear after they're, they're none. If they're not none, they, they get processed. It's kind of very uh, nice. But for now, we're doing a little bit more verbose, a little bit more explicit. That's totally fine. Because remember, our goal is to have optional fields in a bundle. Questions on the Scala options so far? OK, so let's go ahead and put it inside a bundle. Um, OK, so uh, here's a maybe pair, right? So this bundle has definitely one field. And the existence of the second field is dependent on a Boolean. This is a Scala thing, right? So you can see we're defining this to be an optional type of a chisel type, OK? And then based on this Boolean when we're running, we are going to declare it to exist or to not exist. And then um, this generated code is going to you know, instantiate our bundle, great, as the IO. We're going to pass through this parameter because we need this parameter to use it to control that field. And then, hey, if we're using that parameter, we're going to go ahead and connect it. Otherwise, we're not going to connect it. So we can see, for example, in the beginning, we have y, right? So it has y is true. So you know, true is passed over here, and it kind of goes all through. But if I was to say false, it goes away. No IOs, no lines here, code here. And so this is kind of worth paying attention to. And so this is now yet another form of conditional execution we'll be clear about. So remember, last week we talked about the difference between having a Scala if versus a chisel mux, right? Where one was, the Scala if was, you know, conditional at generation time, but the hardware is static, versus the mux, the conditional is at hardware times when the mux takes place. This takes effect at generation time, right? So the Scala option is not a chisel thing, it's a Scala thing. And with this, um, we can have optional IOs. You can do other things with objects too, but a use of this Scala functionality is for optional IOs. Uh, and so you can imagine having more sophisticated modules where you, you know, uh, decide to remove or add ports and that kind of stuff. Um, so it's pretty cool. And so technically in this case, I'm using, for example, right here, you might want to write the code commented out. I'm using this Boolean. Uh, it should be the same. Here you can use the option, right? So seeing did the IO get defined would actually be equivalent and should still produce the same code. Um, you can decide which one is more clear, whether it you know, kind of is better to self-reference or to use the Boolean. They kind of both do the same thing. But the bigger picture here is just that, yeah, we have an optional IO, right? This IO is not always there. We can turn it on or off uh, accordingly. This is kind of another example of parameterization, right? So people say, well, we can do it a generator. Well, the generator isn't just having a variable number of ports. The generator is actually literally adding or removing fields <laughs> based on the parameters given to it. Yeah, question, yes. Oh, so sum is the way you tell an optional thing it exists. So if we go back a slide, uh, the sum function is the way you say it exists. So technically, um, this is one of these things where you know, Scala is a strongly typed language, right? So the type of O in this example is option. Technically, it's a parameterized type, you know, it's a generic. So there's, there's you know, this template type of int. But the point is that O is a 
option, and option can either be a sum or a none. If you want to get really technical, this work is kind of funny. Sum is actually a class, right? Um, you know, it's going to be in this case, it's sum not shown, but maybe, wait, can I wonder if I can uh, just do this, right? So we can see that, yeah, it, it is a, oh, as I see, I was hoping to say what it would say like in value four, but um, it is a thing, right? And meanwhile, none, believe it or not, actually, because none is none, there's actually one singleton none. It's actually an object, but small detail. <laughs> um, but yeah, the key thing is, yeah, so sum is the way you tell an option something exists. Question, yes. Yeah, yeah, because the question is, can you have a companion object with factory methods for a bundle? Yes, 100%. You can definitely declare a, uh, you can extend bundle with an object, yes. Or better yet, you could extend it with the class and then you call it with the object. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. So you can repeat this for recording. You can, yeah, have a bundle being produced by an object and call different versions with different applies. Yes. Yeah, so that is something more, like I said, as you get more familiar with this, you realize the, what, there's a different reason why I use objects. So I said, like, one is the, uh, you know, uh, shared state. Another is the ability to have multiple constructors and they kind of control the way it's used. Um, cool. Okay, so here we made an optional I.O. And then there's a last little thing. I think this comes up in the lab, so I want to make sure we cover it. Um, so this is a Scala method. It's just helpful. So earlier in the quarter, we were using Scala.fill, which is helpful. The proofs of seek, you know, of this many copies of this value. Tabulate will automatically go from zero to this value and then call whatever function you give it. And so, this is one of these Scala methods. We're going to see a few of these in this course where you actually, you know, need to give it a function to actually do the body of what it's doing. And so I don't want to get fully into partial functions. I'll do that at this point. But for now, um, you can do it in two ways. You can say, hey, uh, the simple way is this, the function over here takes a single argument, which is the i, right? Now, whatever your thing is right now, you know, zero, one, two, three. So in this case, we're just passing it straight through. So you can write it pass straight through, or you can modify if you want to, you can say plus one, but we'll run it first, right? See, okay, it passes straight through. If I want to do plus one, no problem. Um, when you have these partial functions like this, because it's such a common thing in Scala, and Scala is like a, you know, function first kind of language, you can use a wildcard. That's what this underscore is. And so rather than writing, you know, I and then I again, you can just do it directly. Now, this is a really, really cool feature. Uh, but you can imagine there's a lot of scenarios where this won't work, which is why you need to use this. Uh, you need to use more for both one. So for example, when you use this wildcard underscore, um, when you use it, you're burning up a variable, right? So if I was to say this plus underscore again, it's going to say, wait, there's no more arguments because, hey, you already used up your, your one argument. It's the one argument function, and you're now trying to use two arguments, right? So for example, if you need to reuse an argument more than once, you need to do more of a both one. But in the case of why we're talking about this at all, this, this tablet method is helpful to kind of count up your things. So for example, we saw like a lookup table example in our last lecture at the VEC. Um, we can do tablet for that, right? To kind of fill it out and that kind of stuff. So this is helpful. You could do this with a for loop. But that's about tablet this way you get a, you know, immutable sequence from the beginning rather than to kind of keep causing it together or something else. Cool. Other questions? Great. Okay, I'm gonna look up the order of invocation of object declarations. <laughs> Post on Slack later today. In terms of assignments, um, we posted Lab Two because we posted it yesterday. We're making it due Thursdays again. Uh, there will be a homework to do uh, this coming Sunday. Hopefully, posted tonight. Um, we're gonna try and figure out what's going on with GradeScope. Normally, students can see the autograder reports, and so hopefully, we can figure out how to make that automated. So that way, you folks or more aware of why it's happy or unhappy. And also office hours uh, starting now, I guess whenever this lecture is done, which is now, so it's also true. Yes, another question? Yeah, uh, so when you want to 
Okay. Oh, good. Oh, the test case. Oh, um, yeah, that's one I have mixed feelings about, but I think you might, I would slack the staff and see if we respond. <laughs> uh, the reason why is, you know, so we, we give you, for the first few examples, we're giving you like various few tests. For later assignments, we'll give you a couple tests. Either way, we want you writing your own test, right? And so um, my goal of getting you to see the output is that way you can be aware of which thing is failing to know where to spend your efforts. Um, but the reason why I'm saying you might contact us, we might say, oh, make sure you handle like this case rather than sending you the exact test case, right? Um, but yeah, definitely that'll be good. So yeah, I'm glad to hear you guys can see the errors, but for a while I was saying only we could see them. I'm like, oh no, it's not good. We want them to see the errors. They want to see the errors. <laughs> okay, well, sounds good. All right. Have a good day, folks.